Thanks, Corey. Um, thanks for uh, having me here today, Sagam. It's always a pleasure to be here. So uh, he, they asked me to talk about common mistakes in managing tibial plateau fractures. Uh, I think it's a little early to be that negative. So let's talk some maybe some tips or some things that maybe can make us a little bit more successful in managing tibial plateau fractures. Here's my disclosures. Really have nothing to do with this. So objectives, going to hopefully understand a little bit of initial management and where we can maybe improve a little bit or some things to look out for to initially managing these injuries understand the surgical goals and what we're actually after here, and then at the end of the day, what are we going to do with these people post-operatively? So this is a patient of mine. This is a 37-year-old male who fell off uh, scaffolding uh, about 30 feet or so, according to the records, and he presents to our emergency room uh, with this injury, uh, complaining of a significant amount of pain, although he doesn't speak English, but he's, uh, you know, obviously very uncomfortable. His, uh, his calf is full, um, and he's got a, a lot of pain. So. What concerns do you have with this individual when we're initially managing this person? Well, for me, obviously, the obvious things are obvious. So compartment syndrome, right? So whenever we see these high energy tibial plateau fractures, or any tibial plateau fracture for that matter, we need to keep this in the back of our mind. Um, so we have to look out for those clinical signs, right? So the extreme pain out of proportion, pain with passive stretch. Um, and anything concerning that matter, if you're not sure, we can consider measuring compartments or not um, to use as an adjunct in our diagnosis of compartment syndrome. But we don't want to miss this, right? Because this could be detrimental if we miss this and, and lead us down a road um, uh, of a uh, poor outcome if we, if we miss this. If we decide to measure just to make sure we're doing it correctly, make sure we're in about within five centimeters of the fracture site itself, that's been shown to give us the, the most accurate measurements. Um, and then we're going to compare those measurements to our diastolic pressure, right? And if we're in within 30 of that, then that's concerning for acute compartment syndrome. And we need to jump on this stuff uh, pretty quickly in order to uh, fight off any uh, sequelae of this. The other thing we want to think about in this type of injury is the vascular status of, of this limb, right? So this is, again, a high energy, these fracture dislocations. We want to make sure we're not missing a vascular injury, which could go on the road to lead to an amputation or something uh, significant of that nature. So it's pretty simple. If you just get a, an ABI on these, uh, on these individuals, you can have your trauma team do it or uh, your resident, or you can do it yourself. And remember, 0.9 is that magic number. So if it's less than 0.9, there's a, a good chance this person might have a vascular injury. Um, so you want to get your vascular colleagues uh, involved immediately, um, especially that, you know, what looks like a relatively benign uh, isolated unicondylar tibial plateau on the medial side, they're often associated with those fracture dislocations that can be uh, compromising the vascular status. So what do we do for this person? What's our next step in timing? How do we go, go down to this algorithm? Well, for him, we were concerned that he had compartment syndrome. We actually didn't measure compartments. Um, so we took him up to the operating room immediately and, and did a uh, four compartment fasciotomy and, and spanned his knee. Now, when we think about doing these fasciotomies, one thing I will kind of throw out there again to kind of avoid a little pitfall is if you're the one managing this or you know this is going to be managed surgically, this, this injury, draw out your surgical incisions before you do your fasciotomy. So that way you can plan your fasciotomy incision not to hinder your definitive approach to fixing this individual. There's debate whether a single incision versus dual incision, which one's better. Honestly, at the end of the day, you need to release the compartments and make sure that you do an adequate job doing this. For me personally, I think if you're facile at a single incision in a bicondylar tibial plateau, it's a great opportunity to use a single incision because you're only compromising one side of the leg, knowing that you'll probably be making two incisions on this individual. The other thing to consider to kind of avoid a pitfall when we frame these people is we want to understand the zone of injury concept, right? It's more than just a bony aspect of what we see. The soft tissue around that injury takes a significant amount of damage as well. So when you put your frame in, make sure your pins, especially in that tibia, are as far away as possible from that zone of injury as far as to not to try to contaminate that fracture hematoma. And if you can, even though we tend to you know, go big or go home with our constructs, if we can avoid any overlap with our pins, uh, with our definitive fixation, that's also good. So try to stay out of that zone of injury uh, when you go to frame these people. So why? Why do we do this? Well, it's length and stable, right? We want to, uh, this is a significant soft tissue injury. Um, so we want to get the soft tissue to calm down before we uh, go on to our surgical uh, plan for this individual. In addition, this is a complex injury, right? We're not going to just whimsically go about this. So it's going to give us time to plan, right? We all like to think we're really smart people, but really we're just good at kind of triaging these things and giving us time and buying ourselves time to make a good plan and make sure we're doing the right thing for this person. 
So now what? What do we do now? Well, now we can start to further evaluate this individual, right? Um, a common thing that we see in our institution is that someone comes in with a plateau fracture, whether it's, you know, especially in these bicondylars, and we get a, they get a CT scan right away because they think that's the next step. CT scan not at the length actually doesn't give us a, a ton of information. Once we uh, get our ligament ataxis, we can gleam a little bit more information from that. So once we get them at the length, we can start to further evaluate this injury. So things to consider once we get them out the length, make sure we're getting good radiographs, right? A true AP and a lateral. And make sure we get a joint ab above and below. It's not uncommon that there's other uh, injuries associated with this. Again, we talked about the CT scan after X-Fix, but it's important to do this. Study back in the 90s showed that 12% of the times it changed classification, but more importantly, almost a third of the time, it changed your treatment plan, right? It gave you an, uh, an idea of where the fracture fragments were and where you needed to go to attack them to address them. Other things, obviously, the soft tissue, right? The skin is an obvious concern here. But don't forget about the other associated soft tissue injuries underneath the skin, right? Your collateral ligaments, your ACL, PCL, your menisci. Remember, there's studies out there showing in these injuries, there's certain radiographic criteria that show there's a, a high rate of these injuries as well. So be on the lookout now. I mean, I think in our institution, we're more likely to get MRIs now just because we're more aware of it. Um, but it's something to be considered of. So what are our goals with this individual or with any individual with a tibial plateau fracture? Well, obviously we want to try to make the joint as, as good as we can. Sometimes that's impossible, right? There's a lot of comminution. We want to restore our conor width and our, our mechanical axis. And then we want to neutralize the metaphysis and secure the tubercle if possible. But all this is in the goal to provide a stable fixation for early range of motion as the soft tissues uh, can respect it. So remember, alignment matters. Back in the 80s, they looked at a bunch of tibial plateau fractures. Those with 10 degrees of varus or valgus instability or invaris, they didn't do as well. So try to get your mechanical axis as best as possible according to uh, that patient. Remember, use the other side. We like to live in symmetry. So we have the other side to look out of. So what's our plan? Now we understand what our goal is. So what's our plan? Well, it's simple, right? Well, there's things you need to think about, right? So how are we going to get there? How are we going to expose this patient? How are we going to visualize the articular segments? What's the soft tissue going to dictate? What implants are we going to use? Where are we going to put them? If we're going to graft a, um, a depression, what are we going to use for graft? So lots of things to think about. And this simple plateau fracture becomes a lot simpler, right? Remember the B-type partial articular injuries, B equals buttress, right? So really all we need to do is uh, create an axilla and prevent that shear force from pushing down um, to buttress that up. For these, we don't need to be as fancy. We can use nice non-locking plates. We don't need to be in the habit of always putting locking plates here and make a nice axilla there to prevent that from collapsing. In these more complex uh, situations, we want to consider two approaches, right? We want to consider column-specific fixation. Remember, it's safe to do. It's okay to make medial lateral incisions on this individual. Think about the plateaus as three columns. We want to address these individually um, in column-specific uh, fixation. Also, don't forget about that posterior medial fragment. Um, it happens a lot of times, up to 75% of times in these high energy injuries. And if we miss that, the femur's going to go with that. If that starts to displace, then we're going to have an ugly looking x-ray. Remember, our lateral constructs don't always uh, uh, ad address that posterior medial segment. So it's rare. It's actually probably the exception rather than the rule to use purely laterally based implants for these bicondylar tibial plateaus. Remember, your fixation, you're just going to miss that posterior medial segment. So you need to address that separately on the medial side when you get there. There's a bunch of evidence in the uh, mid to late 2000s showing that when you dual plate this, um, it's less, like, uh, less likely to fail. So consider addressing that as well. So when do we do this? Well, obviously we want to wait, right? When the soft tissue is ready. We don't want to have a beautiful looking x-ray but be staring at our hardware, right? So be patient. We have time. They're framed. They're ready. To, you know, they can sit for a while. So the skin's ready. So what do we do? How do we address this? Well, oftentimes it's nice to start medially. They say start on the least uh, common side. But if you start medially, you can ha create a building block to build that lateral side to buttress those uh, medial segments. Then you can go laterally, deal with the depression, provisionally fix the articular surface, support the joint, buttress the lateral side, and then definitely uh, support your uh, lateral side. Regardless of what you use, medial lateral, secure your metaphysis. And if there's a large tubercle uh, component, don't forget to address that as well. So for our guy, we actually start in medial. Um, we uh, address the articular segment, uh, posterior medial buttress to buttress that posterior medial segment, long medial plate to neutralize the metaphysis, 
But then we stopped. He was still out the length. Um, his fasciotomy site didn't look so good. There was some escar there, so we debrided that. And we planned to come back about uh, five days later and skin graft him, address, it, address the lateral side as well. So what do we do now, post-op plan? So do we keep them locked up for, for 12 weeks? Well, we protect our weight bearing, but remember, we want to get these people moving because motion is good for the cartilage, right? Um, we know when we have full thickness defects and we move these people, it's more likely to promote hyaline cartilage than to have, and have that cartilage heal for us. So this is him about a year out. He's about zero to 120 range of motion, back to work, and with occasional discomfort, but overall doing pretty well considering he had a pretty significant injury to his extremity. So at the end of the day with these tibial plateau fra fractures, whether they're complex or not, remember, thorough exam, don't forget about compartment syndrome. It happens, especially in these high um, energy injuries. Span the knee, then get your additional imaging. It's gonna be much more useful for you uh, down the road. Our surgical goal, remember, we want to reduce articular surface the best we can, but really make an effort to try to restore your mechanical axis and condylar width. Simple fracture patterns, remember, B is for buttress. Nice, simple constructs do really well here. For complex patterns, dual incisions work well. Consider column-specific fixation. And post-operatively, remember, try to put a, a construct together that's going to allow you to move them early, um, but you probably want to keep them off it for about 12 weeks or so. Thank you.